Um, so a couple of things, just so everybody's on the same page and taking some time to review. Um, in this reaction, we have a nucleophile and we have an electrophile. Which is the nucleophile? The oxygen. The oxygen or the methoxide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oxygen is the nucleophilic atom. Right, that makes the bromide of the bromide the electrophile. Right. Why does this substitution? So, so we know. I mean, it's you know, it's it's easy to, to look at a starting material. Not easy, but it, it's much more possible to look at a starting material, look at a product, and rationalize a mechanism. Right. It's harder to look at just starting materials, figure out what the product is, right, and rationalize the mechanism from that. So if we didn't have the product, why would this mechanism make sense? Why would this reaction be predictable? Because bromide is very strong electron. Uh, bromide, we'll, we'll say it's a really good leaving group, right? A really stable leaving group, right? So if that bromide gets kicked off, right? It's okay, it's not gonna be super reactive, right? It's gonna be pretty comfortable, it's a big fuzzy, big fuzzy uh, can. Right? So the bromide's a good leaving group. Why does the oxygen go to carbon? Why is that carbon in particular the electrophilic carbon? Well, when bromine leaves, there's a problem charge going to the carbon, so those electrons are taken away. So the mechanism that we have drawn doesn't show bromine leaving first, right? It has oxygen coming in and bromine leaving all at the same time. Right? So that means that this oxygen is attracted to this carbon without the bromine being gone first. What you're speaking about, that's a possible mechanism, and we'll get into that. But not for these these reagents. Is that the partially charged? What's that? This being partially charged. Partially charged. Partially. Yeah. Uh, is it that since bromine's a halide, it's very electrophilic and it's pulling a lot of these electrons from carbon? Good. So you get a couple ideas mixed up there, but yeah. So the, the idea is that this bond is polarized towards bromine, right? Bromine is more electronegative, and so that's going to make all of the carbons in this molecule that's going to make this carbon that's connected to bromine the most electrophilic, the most electron deficient, right? And so when we have a nucleophile that has a lot of electron density, that nucleophile is going to be attracted to the most positive part of the molecule. Right? Questions about that? Right, so both of these molecules are polarized so that the positive part of one molecule is meeting up with the negative part of another molecule. Right? Just like we saw last semester with carbonyl chemistry. Right? Carbonyl carbon was always positive. We were just taking different carbonyl molecules and adding a bunch of different nucleophiles to those electrophiles. Questions about it? Elimination mechanism. Anybody come up with the elimination mechanism? That's right. Oh, God. I'll drop it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is right at all. Okay. I uh, hydrogenated the bromide. Uh, uh, no, that's not. That's not <laughs> that. My other thought was that I'm just taking a hydrogen from the carbon that we attacked last time mm -hmm. uh, and trying to use that to throw off the bromine to create another one. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are my two guesses. And you drew a hydrogen somewhere I never even thought about, so. Yeah. Alexis, did you have um, <clears throat> I was, I thought it was something slightly different. I used the product that we got from the substitution, mm -hmm. and I um, added, I hydrogenated, or yeah, hydrogenated it, and then kind of tried to make it a leading group and take all. Okay. So, so you have the right idea, um, but we don't need to go through the substitution first, right? The bromide is always going to be a better leaving group than the methoxide. <clears throat> so here we're using the methoxide as a nucleophile. In elimination, we don't have nucleophiles and electrophiles. Instead, we have bases and acids. Right. So to give you a hint. For this mechanism, I drew a hydrogen on the carbon beta to the bromide. 
right, two bonds away from the bromide. And so rather than the oxygen going towards the carbon, right, this oxygen is going to act as a base. Pluck off a proton, and then the electrons between carbon and hydrogen, those are going to fall down to form a pi bond, right? And then that's <coughs> going to kick out the bromide. So in this case, the bromide is still acting as a leaving group, right? The reaction is moving forward because of the stability of that leaving group, right? But rather than kicking out by direct substitution, we're kicking it out through an elimination mechanism. So when you look at these reaction schemes, hopefully you can see why one is considered substitution, right? So we're starting with two starting materials, ending with two products. So we get the same number of products as we start with starting materials. In el elimination, we're starting with two starting materials, right? But we're ending with three products. We get three things in this reaction. Yeah, so, yeah. So why is methanol in this thing at all? Solid. So whenever you use alkoxide base, it's not always, but a lot of time when you use alkoxide bases, you use the um, alcohol, associated alcohol with the salt. So if we used ethoxide as a nucleophile or base, we would use ethanol. Isopropoxide, isopropyl. Other questions? rationalizing this reaction. Why would it happen this way over happening that way, right? We're not gonna look so much at um, how these are interacting, right? We, it's, it, we can't look at this and say that's a very acidic proton. Protons on carbon typically are not very acidic. We can look at this and say bromine, just like over in the substitution reaction, bromine's a good leaving group, and that um, allows this reaction to go to the right. But another thing to look at here is in the product, right? This would be um, thermodynamically favorable because we're creating a double bond that's in conjugation with the rest of the pi system. Okay, so we're creating a relatively low energy. Um, so we can generalize the electrophile or the acid, right, the, the halide that we have up there um, as an X, right? So the leaving group would be the X. And that leaving group could be bromine, it could be chlorine, it could be uh, 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 sulfonate, it could be any number of leaving groups um, that will go over uh, either on Friday or next Monday, right? And then the nucleophile we're just going to represent as Y, right? And so for each of these reactions, for the substitution mechanism, there are actually two different mechanisms that we can rationalize for substitution, right? Likewise, there are two different mechanisms that we can rationalize for elimination. Both mechanisms will occur, right? In both substitution and elimination, right? So there are four different mechanisms that, that you need to know. They're all relatively easy, right? So for substitution, We 
have a mechanism called the SN2 mechanism. And SN2, all that stands for is substitution in the fluidophilic by molecular. SN2 mechanism, the nucleophile is adding to the electrophile at the same time the leading movement. Right? All of these things are happening at once. The electron movements are happening in concert. Right? You can also rationalize an SN1 mechanism that Frank had alluded to earlier. in two steps. And just like SN1 stands for substitution nucleophilic <coughs> bimolecular, SN1 stands for substitution nucleophilic unimolecular. Both mechanisms are possible, right? Which mechanism actually occurs is going to depend upon the reagents that you're using and the conditions of the reaction. So bimolecular means, all this means is it refers to the, re the reaction rate or the reaction kinetics, right? And so bimolecular means that the reaction rate is influenced by the concentration of two components, right? So in this case, it would be influenced by the concentration of the alkyl halide, right? And then whatever your nucleophile is. So if we decrease the amount of any one of those, either one of those, we're also going to decrease the rate of the reaction. Right? If we increase the amount of any one of those, we're also going to increase the rate of the reaction. Right? And that should make sense because in order for this reaction to take place, these two things have to meet up. Right? They have to be in the flask, get close to each other, and interact. And so if we decrease the amount of either one of those, we're going to decrease the probability that they're going to meet up in the flask right? or how frequently they're able to meet up in the flask. Make sense, everybody? Yeah. Contrast unimolecular means that the 
the rate of the reaction is going to be influenced only by the concentration of one of the reaction levels, right, or one of the components of the reaction. Can you see that for you? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Right, so if we take a look at the SN1 mechanism, okay, this would be an energy diagram that we could draw for the SN1 mechanism. And you can see it's the first step. That is the rate limiting step for the reaction. Right, so whatever happens in the second step, right, it's fast enough that it doesn't limit the rate, right? It's just that first step that is going to influence the rate of the reaction. Right, and so in the SN1 reaction, what is happening in the first step? Leaving group is leaving. Leaving group is leaving. And what's what's the only molecule that's involved in that first step? Um, just the starting material. Yeah, the electrophile, right? Not the yeah. nucleophile, right? So the nucleophile doesn't come along until the second step. And so it's this step that is the rate limiting step of an SN1 reaction, right? The loss, not necessarily the first step, but the loss of the leaving group from the electrophile. Formation of the carbocation the rate limiting step. Okay, these are always kind of confusing at, at first, right? Because you look at this and you say SN2 must be a two-step mechanism. That's not what the two means, right? The two refers to how many things are influencing the rate, right? Same thing with SN1. SN1 must be a one-step mechanism. Again, it's not, it does not mean a one-step mechanism. It just means that there's one thing that determines the rate of that reaction. So I have a question. Sure. So like when carboxylic acid and like a strong acid be an SN2? Um, so so what, what do you want to do with it? Like for instance, like, or not a um, carboxylic acid, like carboxylic acid derivative. Okay, so, so like a Fischer esterification yeah. going from an ester to a carboxylic acid. So that's a substitution. It, it wouldn't fall under the same, um, it's because it's, it's carbonyl chemistry, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't fall under the same category. Um, we could say, yeah, it's acid catalyzed, so it's, yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, yeah, completely different. But it, but it, it is a substitution, you're right, right? It's just it's a carbonyl substitution. Questions about this? Bimolecular elimination mechanism versus a unimolecular elimination mechanism. Again, the two means that there are two things that influence the rate, right? The one means that there's only one thing that's going to influence the rate.
Raise your hand if you need more time. Who wants to describe the ET mechanism? <coughs> Base is going to pull the proton, sigma electrons will fall down to make a new pi bond, right? At the same time, we're kicking out the ET, right? So, we, I mean, when we draw these, unless we have three hands, we have to draw one arrow at a time, right? But realize that all six electrons are moving at the same time, right? There's not one thing that goes first and then it's a cascade, right? Everything's happening at the same time, right? And that gets us to our alkene product, we have YH. And then our leaving group just hanging out. Right? So you can see in, the, in this step, really the only step of the elimination mechanism, right? Our base is interacting with our acid, right? So both have to be in there. If we decrease the amount of the base, it's less likely that they're going to meet up in the flask. The reaction is going to take longer. The rate's going to be less. Right? If we in increase the amount of the the acid or the electrophile, right, that's going to increase the rate. So both of those components are going to determine the rate in the E2 mechanism. Right, what about unimolecular? What is the unimolecular mechanism? Okay. Could it like be that but like one step? Um, so this is this is one step. Or um, um, could the X be the first step of the leading group, and then your intermediate would be uh, positive carbon, and then the oxygen would grab off the hydrogen, and then the electrons would form another bond. Good. Right, so you can see the first step the loss of the leaving group, only one component is involved in that, right? Only the electrophile or, or the acid is involved in that. That's going to be the rate limiting step of the reaction. Okay, we form the carbocation. And that carbocation is so reactive, right, that that second step is going to be really, really fast. It's not going to determine, not going to determine the rate, right? So this is the step that's, that's slowing the reaction down or determining the overall reaction rate. There's only one component involved in that step, right? And so we would get um, be denoted as the E2 or the E1 reaction. Right, questions about this? Yeah? Um, how can we say, so in the substitution, this is going back, but sure. in, in, a, in a substitution by bimolecular, yeah. um, how can we say that it's not always one step? Yeah, good question. 
So, example, this is going to be a substitution reaction. First step is going to be protonation of oxygen. Second step will be the substitution. There are, I mean, the overall substitution is still just one, one step, right? But to prepare a leaving group, we have to protonate that first, right? And then once the reaction is over, we have to keep protonating. It's, 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 uh, it's still a bimolecular, a bimolecular substitution because it's, it's, it relies on two factors. Yeah, yeah, the substitution itself is. So we'll, we'll end there. Um, so on Friday, what we're going to do is we're going to talk more about substitution, dig a little deeper into the SM1 and SM2 mechanisms, and figure out what conditions um, will favor one mechanism over the other.